the network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Welcome to A State of Control. This is the podcast dedicated to the control automation and programming part of the AV industry uh, put on by AV Nation. My name is Steve Greenblatt. I'm your host today. Uh, we have a very exciting show on tap, and to help me with that, I have, uh, as usual, our favorite uncle, Uncle Richie, Rich Fergoza. How are you today, Rich? I'm doing great. Uh, mellow East Coast greetings. Uh, this time around, I am uh, stopping in from vacation right before I head to lovely Key West, but I had to uh, hang in with uh, the usual band of suspects and make sure that uh, Uncle Richie... Uh, keeps an eye on everybody. That's what Keep I'm us from getting in trouble, huh? Exactly. Or, or, or inside it. Or, or inside a riot. Trouble. One of the two. I'm sure that'll happen today. Uh, also with us today is uh, Bernard Morgan from ICS Plus. Hi, Bernard. How are you? You're doing well, Steve. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. And last but not least is John Pavlik from Crestron Electronics. How are you, John? Doing fine. Thanks for joining us. So today we're going to talk about a little bit of a highly criticized topic, something that uh, has drawn some attention in the industry, especially after uh, Infocom, where many manufacturers are discussing the idea of uh, no program necessary control system solutions. And uh, as programmers and as people who make their livelihood uh, based around control systems, this is something that could be a cause of concern, but I but I do believe that it, it does have a place in our industry, and it's something that uh, we're going to dive into a bit today. So uh, to start us off, Rich, um, we've discussed this a bit before on on different shows, and and we've looked at different platforms to make programming easier. Um, but when it comes to a, a solution that doesn't require programming, where do you see that? sitting within the industry and and how how do you go about approaching that when you're talking to a customer um, I think it's always been there I, I, I feel that what you know again it, it comes back to opportunity it comes back to seizing opportunity um, I think there's tons of projects and um, situations where a control system just isn't going to fit the budget necessarily in a um, a custom or, or or kind of the configuration that we're used to um, and when you have the quote-unquote no programming approach, it's not no programming. It's never been that. It's just we're just changing the term. Configuration still has to occur. Testing still has to occur. I mean, all of these things still need to occur that somebody who is trained in the process has to be able to deliver it. What they're able to do is more effectively um, recreate it on projects where you don't necessarily need a dedicated senior or a junior programmer. You can, you can use this as, a, I've always felt it as a hybrid. Um, and, and I think that where we always wind up running into this dilemma is that we don't always necessarily figure out what our terms are as an industry. Um, programming is kind of this nebulous thing that gets thrown around. If something goes wrong, it's programming. If something goes right, it's programming. If it's a handheld device that doesn't connect to the internet, it's programming. It, yeah, it just it gets bandied around too loosely, I think. And I think manufacturers also jump on that point. Um, it's it's catchy. Um, it's and part of it is you got to be able to sell it through, right? And from a marketing standpoint, um, I don't think that it's always accurate. Um, and that's where I feel that the integrator, that's their best opportunity to be able to come in and say, the sense where we are providing a custom solution, where somebody is creating something specifically for you based on a spec or any of these other things, that, that's not what we're offering. What we're offering you is something that's cost-effective, replicatable, um, and that may fit a budget point that they can pass on um, in their budget meetings that they may never have had the, the facilities person may never have had the opportunity to do so. Um, and, and more so than not, especially with control systems, um, it keeps people in the mindset that this is still about integrated systems. Um, you know, with, with, with apps and with, with consumer devices, you know, we, we've got fragmentation. And so I find that the no programming solution 
is a bit of a, uh, it allows for that Trojan horse to come in to be able to prevent fragmentation and still be able to deliver a solution that, um, y you know, they couldn't have gotten before. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of it, but I, I always see that as an opportunity to reach somebody who always thought that they were priced out of the solution. So basically you're saying that there is a, a place for it within the industry, but it isn't necessarily going to take over the industry. I think you need to be prepared for it. I think you need to embrace it. I think if you don't embrace it, um, from a business standpoint, you're a fool. Um, it, it's just that it, the, the greater technology industry is moving to that. <laughs> the, you know, and, and so to think that we are immune to it, um, it, 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 it's 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 not the way to run your business, um, and it's it's all about collaborating. You know, here's my West Coast thing, baby. We all got to get along. You, know? you got to embrace, and you know, uh, you know, you got you get you got to hug it out with whoever's coming in. And uh, I think it's an opportunity. And I know for manufacturers, and John will probably be able to speak to this from a support standpoint. It allows them to free up engineers and senior people to help with the big dogs, the big projects. Because they can at least um, consolidate and 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 keep some form of order within their framework um, section of software. So from a support standpoint, it frees up the manufacturer to be able to provide support on the larger systems or the more complex systems. Because you don't have a senior engineer sitting there going, "Did you turn the device on or off? Is your Crestnet cable plugged in? You know, I mean, did you set an IP table?" And and these are calls that they get every five or ten minutes, you know, I mean, that's just, just the nature of the beast. So it, it forms that demarcation line. So again, I, I, I find it as a win-win. So I, I guess uh, with a little bit of foreshadowing, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll shift over to you, John. Um, Crestron has uh, taken the plunge and, and has gone in this direction, and, and one such uh, offering is AV, .AV framework, and we're, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go on. But when when this was first brought to the table, what what was the the thought process and what what was the motivation behind it? Well, there's a, a couple of different key things. One of them is that as these systems do get necessarily more complicated, uh, we're certainly far past the days where we were uh, implementing one or two very simplistic pieces of equipment in a room, and now we come to uh, scenarios where we have very integrated systems that are reporting up to centralized servers to be able to uh, report on statistics and, and save all the data that we need in order to effectively both run our enterprises as well as to be able to analyze our enterprises and see where we are. And so as those things become more complicated, it's uh, unbearably expensive for people to have to replicate that over and over and over again. So by providing a system that is uh, essentially written just once, it can be better tested, uh, which means it can be better supported as well as it can be rolled out in a much more uh, economic uh, fashion. So I think that's really the, the kind of the key pieces. Uh, I think an, an extra benefit of that is that as enterprises have become more global operations, uh, where AV facilities are are combined instead of being each managed by their own regional office, you start to get the benefits of a user experience where the uh, London conference room and the New York conference room and the Tokyo conference room all actually work the same way. If everybody's uh, continuing to create very customized solutions, then that you don't have that kind of a scenario, and, and that starts to uh, work against uh, some of the larger enterprise customers. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Um, I, now, Bernard, let, let me bring you into the conversation here. The uh, the, the idea of the, this this type of a solution and being a programmer and, and, and being somebody who has to have these conversations with your customers or maybe even feeling some of the pressure that they're going to expect something that doesn't require programming. How do, you, how do you go about approaching that, and, and where, where do you see this driving your future business? Well, I think that the first thing to do is take a look at what Rich said earlier. I think what has happened in the industry has always been a combination of terms all get looped into programming. You have commissioning, you have design, you have QA, 
and ends up being on a, a line item, shows up as one thing called programming, but you're truly touching three or four different pieces of the, of the process, all the way up from design even. And so what happens a number of times when you see that programming number, it's understanding what that is. Is that just programming? And I think if you poll most of the programmers, how much time when they're on, how much time do they actually spend programming versus debugging, commissioning? And how much time do they spend on the program? I think that that's an interesting statistic that when we pull our teams here and when I talk to other programmers at Masters, it's actually kind of an interesting number to hear because a lot of time is spent not necessarily programming the system, it's commissioning. So I think, or debugging, which is not, and when you hear the term debugging, are you debugging the code or, or is it something inside the environment that you're having to adapt to? And I think those terms aren't defined to just roll up the one line item and it gets sticker shock sometimes because you truly are touching different pieces. And depending on how the the systems were quoted or went to market, it you know it overinflates a number that's not truly there. Um, I don't think as far as you know you know more configurable systems or no programming systems. I uh, I think there's definitely a benefit in that because it adds consistency. I think the biggest thing is defining what the playground that you can play with in these systems and knowing what the breakpoints are or what you can and can't do so we properly implement a pre-programmed solution or a solution that doesn't have programming. I think one of the best things to look at this is take a look at D3. And although D3 is mainly for lighting, that's a very similar thing where it's technically no programming. It's configured. And some of the devices that come into lighting systems are pre-configured. You plug them in, they turn on and off. And I think that's, you know, it was a successful product for Crestron for a number of years. I'm still a big fan of it. I hope it doesn't go away anytime soon. <laughs> help, help, wink, wink. But it's, it's, it's a prime example of when something is deployed correctly and people understand what the playground rules of a pre-configured system or a system that needs no programming, what you can do and what you can't do. And that's been a very successful model for us to use that as a break, a jumping off point and then add the customization around it. I, which I think brings up a really good point, and, and that's one of the d directions that I was going to go into, is that Crestron's always been no, known, and, and, and other control manufacturers, for being able to provide that customized solution, being able to, to really do what some of the lower-end control systems are capable of doing. Um, the ability to go beyond just a configured system I think is important and, and I, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, as, as we delve into uh, AV Framework a little bit, John, maybe you can kind of share with us a little bit of the, the, uh, the overview of it for those who aren't familiar and then maybe kind of take us through how you go, somebody would go about approaching uh, a project and, and possibly the, the ability to, to add that customization. Sure. The basics of uh, the AV framework are it's creating a presentation solution uh, currently based around our DMPS line of products, uh, but eventually to be migrated to uh, all manner of Crestron products to be able to easily create a presentation system. Uh, and in the next, over the next months, uh, more conferencing uh, will be added to that solution as well. Uh, but primary to that is some of the uh, more challenging aspects of it, of uh, being able to have a single code base, be able to uh, bring up a web page, configure the system, add, remove equipment, change sources, and so forth, uh, and be able to download uh, drivers to be able to control that individual uh, bits of equipment. And then finally, kind of rounding out the, uh, the feature set is connections to Fusion uh, so that we can get all the reporting about usage and statistics and all the analysis that we want to be able to do to keep track of, the, uh, of how the room is being used uh, to make better use of our facilities. Now, on top of that, there are a number of things that we did in order to be able to expand upon AV Framework. So there are some very basic things uh, in terms of uh, creating uh, a, a very basic inter-system uh, sort of uh, communication mechanism that's uh, based on simple windows. So all of the existing Crestron programmers will find it very familiar to simply be able to hook into the program, whether it be to uh, bring it into something like a BMS or some other lighting system, 
or to be able to uh, do some extra switching, uh, extra uh, DSP management or something along those lines based on your sources. And so all of that can be done just by writing a, another smaller program. And the benefits of that is that as Crestron enhances the AV framework itself, that doesn't affect this other program that, that's managed by another person, which gives you a, a smaller point of things to actually test, uh, which is also a critical part of this. Um, as well as that, we are adding, uh, releasing SDKs for our various types of uh, drivers that go into the system so that people can customize based on the equipment that's actually in the room. So whether it be a display or a, another Blu-ray drive or some other media device that we haven't necessarily anticipated, of being able to plug those devices into a system in, in meaningful ways. Uh, thirdly, we do have our Crestron Studio package as well, which is really that is the vehicle that we consider for customizing AV framework. And so like uh, D3 Pro, it, it's kind of a, a, a light programming sort of uh, 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 tool, but it is, uh, it is a programming tool where you can integrate all your own macros and do some, some uh, additional logic than from what you had done before. So the intent is to keep AV Framework and Crestron Studio uh, intertwined so that if you plug in the exact same equipment in your AV Framework uh, system, bring that same equipment into Crestron Studio and don't do anything else, it should generate the same thing, right? Because this is really what, what Crestron thinks represents a good user experience, and so we want to keep that uh, consistent. Um, there are uh, there are certainly some features right now that we're uh, working on getting both of them up to parity, uh, but that will be happening uh, later this year. So that's great. I, I I appreciate that overview, and I think that that gives us a little bit of good background. It sounds to me like there is a lot of opportunities for programmers to get involved. So that that no programming needed uh, moniker doesn't necessarily represent the roadmap of the product. Or, or, or the platform, let's call it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think a lot of times the message of uh, no programming required gets uh, mixed up in uh, people's minds as no programming possible, and that's a, a very different thing. <laughs> so what we really want to do is we want to be able to make all those things that are, everybody has to do, the easy things, uh, make them simple and make them uh, not complicated for, for somebody to have to go and, and repeat uh, the same thing time after time after time. But we always want to make sure that, uh, that uh, as we've, we've always said, there has to be a way to, to get to yes, of yes, I can do that, yes, we can make that happen. And the customizing uh, aspects of it are, are always going to be required for some portion of these spaces. Excellent. Um, so, Rich, given, given that uh, overview and given those details, and uh, how... Will you see this falling into your approach to to programming projects in the future? And and what what do you think um, are, is the decision criteria? I guess whether to to stay in in the custom realm, which may be more comfortable, or to to invest in in AV framework. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting that this comes up. I had a an interesting kind of fun thing happen um, over the weekend. So my I have two vehicles. And um, we made the decision a couple of days ago, my wife uh, needed a commuter car. So we decided to purchase a third vehicle. Um, and as we were looking at vehicles, that, one of the things I always look for is, right, is, that, you know, say you're buying a vehicle. You know, obviously everybody wants a Mercedes. Everybody wants, you know, a performance vehicle. The, the, the want list is always there. The value and the budget proposition may not always match the want list. And I found myself, when we were looking at... Um, these vehicles, it, it's kind of the, the difference right now between, say, a framework or a configured solution and a custom solution. Simple example. My hit list for a third option vehicle, basically, not my primary vehicle, my needs were much different and much simpler um, that I, I, I wanted from that vehicle. And although we were about to, we were looking at the vehicle and there was 15 different options to choose from you know, working all the way up. And as we looked at the other units, and although they had provided great features and there was all kinds of customizability and all of these things, it wasn't a feature we needed. It wasn't a feature we were going to use in this specific 
use case. That's where I see the lines always being drawn between a framework application or a configurable application and a customer, a bespoke or, uh, um, you know, or a, a, a purpose-driven program. We tend to use that term a lot, is that we, we write purpose-driven code. It is written for a specific purpose, for a specific individual, for a specific, sorry, set of tastes. Um, there, there are situations where you have that, and there are situations where you don't have that. And, and uh, again, take a look at what, and, and I'll talk about all these other manufacturers. Again, we're talking about the commercial realm right now, but in the resi realm, you have, you know, Savant, Control 4, Elan. All of these other wonderful control manufacturers and audio manufacturers are also looking at the same thing. They're saying, look, we, we are looking to find a way to appeal to a greater market than we ever could before by being able to simplify and streamline the process in order to be more cost effective. You're a lot, when you're a lot more cost effective, you have the opportunity to deploy differently. Now, does everybody want the huge job? Does everybody want the 30,000 square foot house? Does everybody want the executive boardroom or, or the knock or, or, or you know, all, all, you know, all of these, you know, or the airbase? Everybody wants them. The question becomes a matter of what is your company capable of? What can you do from a scheduling, from a staff, and from your bandwidth standpoint and your ability to deploy to be able to get something done? And again, the name of the business is still get in, get out, get paid, right? So if I can provide a solution and say in Crestron's realm, Crestron is looking at developing, um, was it Crestron Home Elements? Is that the what the the, yes. the initials are standing for, John? Uh, for uh, custom, yeah, uh, see, Crestron Home Elements. Yes, that's right. For the Resi side, you know, and again, they are they looked and said these are the general devices that are used in a majority of the residences that we encounter that a Crestron system is deployed, and they put together a nice little package. Is it a complete package? No. Is it something that um, it would wind up having to grow? And I would believe so over time, based on field experience, as more things are deployed, as more devices come online. Yeah, you know, is it a bespoke solution? No, it's not. Um, but does it give people an experience that Crestron is hoping to deliver from a consistent basis that they necessarily couldn't before because they were dealing on the individual programmer, whether it was a staff programmer in an integration firm or a contract programmer? So, again, I think if there's the ability to take um, a consistent approach in a cost-effective manner, whether it's residential or commercial, always go with that first. Respect your client. And and that's that, I think that's sometimes the thing... We don't always respect our client in that sense. We we don't always make sure that we're listening for what they really need. We sometimes get caught up in what we think they should have. And in many instances, if you're listening and if you are approaching it in that conversation and advise and be a technology advisor and say, here's the pathways that you can go. And these are not unintelligent people. Let them make the decision. But now they have an option, and you have an option as a company. And again, I, I you know, if it if it makes you more profitable, that's really the name of the game. Um, you know, if you if if you need to suffer for your art and make sure that each one is absolutely perfect and individual and has your company's DNA on it, you know, those days are gone. It's like you know, I, I pity the fool, pity the fool that <laughs> that thinks that they're gonna maintain a business model that way. It's it, look, look at mobile devices. Yeah, you know, look, look at everything. Uh, it's a software world. Bernard, were you going to jump yeah. in? Yeah, I think Rich hit the nail on the head. I think it really boils down to really understanding needs assessment from the client and, and understanding what they're saying and what they're not saying. And there's nothing better to have more tools in your tool bag when you go to work on something. And then you just decide, do I need the sledgehammer? Do I need the scalpel? Or do you need a hammer drill? And just having those tools and understanding the tools is what the, the pre-configured systems have, have a stability to do. It brings a situation where maybe you have, hey, for this room here, we can use the pre-configured system, but in these rooms over here, we need to use you know, a more traditional customizable approach. But I think it really boils down to understanding the needs assessment and understanding how to use the tools. And the more efficient we can be with the tools, to go to Rich's point, allows everybody to deliver a more consistent and you know, stable solution when you understand the tools. And if someone's taking the time to spend hundreds of hours in developing 
a, something that's reproducible and say, here, this piece of it's here, test it, and it works. And now you can know that that module works and that switching works like that, and you can gra grab onto that and expand it. That's the ideal scenario for programmers. So uh, I'll, um, I'll I'll play a little bit of devil's advocate there. Um, do you have that ability to make that decision, or is that something that's going to be predefined for you? Is it something that the customer or the consultants or whomever is going to have already defined and determined which path to go down, or do you feel like there is going to be the ability to use this at your disposal for determining, for creating efficiencies and, and figuring out ways to to make it benefit your business? Well, I think that's one of the challenges and also one of the things that is uh, our skill set is to things hit the marketing blender and they never <laughs> come out what they potentially were said to do. And I think one of the things that we have to do a lot in our needs assessment is also educate. And I think that's the biggest thing with this is educating and explaining what the differences are and what you can and can't do. And like I said, I always use the term to find the playground rules, and I think that's going to be the, the pivotal piece here of making sure this is successful with the pre-programmed systems is understanding what those playground rules are and saying we can do this because it's inside the playground rules or we can't do this because it's outside the playground rules. And that's the one thing that uh, you know we – need to understand and uh, and hopefully Crestron continues to document really well like what we can and can't do and hopefully that doesn't get mixed in with the marketing blender too because the marketing <laughs> blender is going to put put it through the blender no matter what and they're and they're right the pre-configured systems does save time no program required but you still have to program it and is it a square peg round hole scenario Sure, I, I, and I guess we'll we'll put John on the spot a little bit, but um, it is are, are there um, re, there are guidelines that we should be looking at when when we're approaching uh, a project and and how how should we factor in the AV framework into our decision criteria as to talk when we're talking to customers? Don't put two hundred items on Crestnet. It's probably the first one to start. <laughs> Not an AV framework project. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think I think the place to start really is is uh, you know, being familiar with the capabilities of what AV Framework uh, does, and we're certainly trying to make sure that those get documented. Um, and if it fits, why would you do why would you do more, right? So I think that is that is a big piece. Um, I heard both uh, Bernard and Rich talk about the needs of the customer, and so that really balances in two, and 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 trying to figure out the difference between. Uh, what the customer needs versus what we know that we're able to do, and so we do it anyway. Um, and being able to kind of contain ourselves a little bit so we don't get to be those over-anxious programmers that are just, wow, I can do that, so I guess I will. Um, <laughs> and uh, so really understanding what the customer is and, and understanding the, the capabilities of the AV framework as is, uh, I think are really the, the first crucial steps in, in trying to assess what can and should be done. Um, and like I said, I think the, the piece of, of not doing more than is necessary is, is a big part of this. Uh, testability is, is a major factor in all of this. One of the uh, benefits of this is that we, we're able to do the, uh, the regression testing every time we make a release and be able to make sure that things all work uh, as they're supposed to. And, uh, and can do it in a relatively large scale automated way because we have the economy of scale and we can we can uh, leverage the fact that this is being used in, in hundreds of, of locations uh, as opposed to uh, individual programmers coming down and testing one program for one uh, location and it's, it's just not an efficient manner not, not to mention it's not always easy to uh, to adequately reproduce uh, some of those systems I've, I've certainly had uh, more than uh, a share of programmers that told me, well, you know, I didn't actually get the equipment until I was on site. So uh, programmers are writing everything to spec, and then uh, who's who's a, who's doing the testing? You know, the end user really, um, and that's that's certainly not fair to the customer either. And I think John brings up a really good point right there too, that when we talk about pre-configured systems, is the deployment strategy in that. And I think that's a huge thing to talk, talk about up front because if you're deploying three, four hundred rooms at once in a facility, the change management at that point is a huge, huge consideration. 
And I think, you know, once again, it comes back to the pre-configured systems are great in that point, but then you still have the commissioning side. So I, I think, and, and I, I could agree with you there, Bernard, and, and one of the things that, that we face, I think, as programmers is the idea that all we do is just write code. And and the so so the the uh, and and of course when something doesn't work we blame it on the code so it'll certainly be uh, a little bit of a confidence boost knowing that that this code works and and that it and that as long as it's set up properly and everything is installed right everything should come together as planned um, it, it so so I think that there is some. There is some need of, of us uh, uh, educating the industry and uh, collectively, um, both from a manufacturer standpoint and from a service provider standpoint. So on that note, uh, we, we've uh, reached our, our time for today, um, and, and I appreciate everybody's uh, participation, and I think that this was a, a nice, lively discussion. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up by uh, just thanking uh, you guys for, for joining us. Um, uh, Rich, um, thanks for being here today, as usual. And uh, how can everybody reach you and uh, learn more about your company? Oh, always happy to be here. Um, John, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. It's, I think it's always great when we get the manufacturers to um, provide some information as, as to their approach. So um, we really appreciate that part. In terms of me, I'm going to try it. There we go. For, you, for those of you not listening and watching, you can find me on the Twitters, at rfragosa on Twitter. You can also find me at fergosadesign.com. Um, you can find me on CE Pro. If you type my name in in the Facebooks or the interwebs, invariably something comes up. And uh, also, I uh, will see you at Cedia this year as a, another member of the Cedia Tweep social media team. So some exciting stuff that will be coming along in uh, about the next 60 days. Very cool. And I'm sure another Uncle Richie dinner. Absolutely. Got to have family dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get like this by eating salads, baby. <laughs> uh, John, thank you very much for joining us today, and I think that your contribution was very insightful and, and informative for us. Um, how can uh, everybody reach you and, and learn more about Crestron? Well, certainly uh, uh, www.crestron.com is a good uh, good starting place. Um, I'm around on LinkedIn and in some other places. Crestron Labs, for anybody who is uh, is there, I'm always uh, around, and uh, certainly feel free to reach out to me. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, post your cell phone number for anybody who just absolutely needs to get a hold of Crestron, right? Yeah, that's that's <laughs> no problem because I try not to answer it anyway. <laughs> No, Rich, uh, it just forged right back to you, Rich. You know. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Bernard Morgan, thanks for joining us today. Uh, how can everybody reach you? Uh, thanks for having me, and John, thanks again for hopping on today. The best way to get in touch with us is through the website, www.icsplusonline.com. Very cool. Um, well, uh, my name again is Steve Greenblatt. I can be reached uh, on many social media platforms at Steve Greenblatt. Very easy and straightforward. My company is Control Concepts and we're at controlconcepts.net. But I would like to remind everybody to visit the uh, AV Nation website, avnation.tv, to uh, view and listen to not only this podcast, but AV Week and Resi Week and AV Social and many other uh, podcasts that uh, the list is growing, uh, the Internet of, of Things podcast I think is a, another great one for this audience uh, so so please visit the website uh, avnation.tv uh, thanks for joining us today and we'll uh, be in touch uh, in, by next month <laughs>